today's topic is caregiving, and we're going to talk about caregiving in very broad and general terms. The caregiving for our youngest members of society, all the way to our elders and anyone in between, and talk about how that task, that, that obligation, that responsibility of adulthood intersects with the, res with the responsibilities that people have in the workplace. I love that we are entitling this, uh, set, this whole program Unfinished Business, stamped on our front covers because we are really dealing with some of the unfinished business of the changes that were wrought by the Minnesota Women's Movement in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and we have some heroines of that movement in the room, and I would be remiss in not acknowledging a few of them. Nina Rothschild, thank you for being here. First Chair of the Council of the Economic Status of Women, Aviva Breen, her successor at the Council. Thank you, Aviva, for being here, and Phyllis Kahn, still hanging in there after all these years in the Minnesota Legislature. Thank you, Phyllis, for all you've done for women's rights in this state. And there are probably others of you who I'm going to be remiss in not uh, uh, acknowledging, and I apologize for that right now. But I'd like to begin by just acknowledging how, how women uh, perceive the caregiving issue a bit differently, and I think this is a cultural thing. I used to hear a lot the line, and maybe you did too, the line that the, that the best long-term care insurance policy is a daughter who loves you. We heard that line before. We were taught, I think a lot of us, that to be good daughters, we had to take care of our aging parents. To be good mothers, we ought to be home a lot with our kids. To be good spouses, good wives, we had to take care of the, the, the caregiving needs of our spouses as, as they went, went through various changes in their lives. Society encourages us to be good daughters and mothers and wives, and yet women who play that role during their working years are two and a half times more likely to live in poverty when they're elderly than those who do not. That mixed message is what we're here to talk about today. You have in your packet some interesting statistics that I'd like to call your attention to about who the average caregiver is. She's a 49-year-old woman, that's the average caregiver in this country, who's working 20 hours per week unpaid to care often for her mother, you see, caregiving is a women's issue both on both sides of that, that relationship. That uh, of those who are working, in, who are providing care, so 61 percent at every, any given time in this country are in the workforce. Three out of five caregivers in this country are in the workforce as well. Now, uh, one in five retirees said in a national survey that they left the workforce early because of caregiving. That's one of the consequences of, of this responsibility. And seven in 10 said that they made work accommodations, including cutting back to part-time, in order to do the, play this role. This has economic consequences. It, one study said it, it, uh, it cost those who did this kind of adjustments in their work lives more than $300,000 over their lifetimes and lost wages, benefits, and social security because they made those adjustments. So this is real money for real people in this country. But I think this is a problem for employers as well, and that's why I'm delighted we have an employer on our panel today. This is a problem in terms of lost productivity. One estimate had it at $33 billion a year in this country from just the full-time workers alone who have to take time off for caregiving. And as a time when we have a looming labor shortage in this country, and especially in the state of Minnesota, Keeping caregivers able to shoulder all their responsibilities of both in their personal lives and in their work lives is really in everyone's interests. Well, we have a great panel to talk about this today, and I'll just introduce them quickly. On my immediate right is Senator Carla Nelson, Republican of Rochester, serving, I think it is her second term in the Senate after having also term, served one term in the House. She was a teacher, a businesswoman, she's a wife and a mother of three sons, and her district includes Rochester and some surrounding communities and townships in Olmstead County. Uh, she was involved heavily last year in the Women's Economic Security Act that was passed. Next to her is Pam Sartell, and we're delighted to have Pam with us. Pam is a business owner, and one of the fun things I learned about Pam by looking at her Sartell Group website is that she's the one who keeps the office refrigerator stocked. Now, if that's not caregiving, I don't know what is. She's going to be sharing the perspective of a business owner in helping to keep her staff of about 20 workers. Is that right, Pam? keep them uh, able to meet all their obligations of adulthood. And then at my far right is, is Hetty Tripp. Hetty is director of the National Asian Pacific Women's Forum at, at the St. Cloud chapter, and she's an adjunct faculty member at St. Cloud State University. And pertinent to this panel, she's also been a caregiver. 
What we're going to do, folks, I've, I'm concerned that you haven't been talking enough, you audience members. So what we're going to do is ask each, each of these panel members to share a few minutes of reflection on this topic, how it has affected them personally, both in their personal lives and in their work lives. And then we're going to open it up for questions. There, I hope, will be somebody carrying a microphone around. Is that the case, Deb? Yeah, she's nodding her head, hopefully. <laughs> So we hope to be able to amplify your voices and your questions, and, and we'll go uh, at this for about uh, 45 minutes from this point. So thanks so much. And Senator Nelson, I'd like you to begin. Tell us about your work in this realm of the intersection between caregiving and uh, uh, professional lives. No? Yep, on. Okay. Well, well, that certainly woke you up for sure. Uh, it is great to be here. I am Senator Carla Nelson, as Lori said. And let me just say, this is a much nicer day than when we were here last year. <laughs> Only the very hardy were able to get here last year uh, during what might have been the worst storm uh, of the... Um, of the of the winter at that point so great to be here today and certainly we've done a lot of work and uh, there's a lot of reasons why sitting right here but I thought I'd tell you as uh, Lori said a little bit about my role as a caregiver uh, and and as a legislator and how they do intersect um, as a caregiver um, I will tell you uh, as uh, Lori said I'm the mother of three boys I used to say they're young boys but now they're 32 30 and 29 so uh, I guess they're still young uh, but in a different sense of the word and um, back in the um, 80s when my children were born the 80s early 90s um, I uh, went back to teaching uh, as the youngest one uh, started first grade so I'd been a teacher and then as three children in pretty short time came along I stepped out of the teaching profession for about 10 years and um, then to re-enter uh, the profession was a little difficult. Um, I, you know, people wondered, well, why, did, why weren't you in the workforce for the last 10 years? And so, of course, I was very clear and explained that I needed at that point uh, to be home uh, with my children. And now, um, I don't mean to say that's the right decision for everybody at all. That's a wonderful thing about our society. There's no one right answer about how we should be raising our families or living our careers. Uh, but I was, ha I was happy for that opportunity. But I will tell you, there was that gap, which I think some women uh, face today. When you've stayed out of the workforce because there are other needs or other priorities at that time, sometimes there's a challenge in getting back into the workforce. Uh, skills change. Uh, they Environment changes, and I think the thing that I found was um, the importance of verifying that what I did was valuable and why I did stay out, and then how that was going to help me be a better employee. And what we have found is a lot of times uh, people who come back into the workforce after some sort of hiatus for whatever reason actually are regener uh, energized and actually do very, very well. And so I, I appreciated that freedom uh, that I had to do that. And now today, uh, I'm at the other end of the caregiving spectrum. Uh, my father has Alzheimer's, and so we're traveling that road, that journey. He's in the latter stages of Alzheimer's, and I am the caregiver. Uh, as the eldest daughter, the only daughter, uh, this is my job, and, and I took this job, and it's the right thing to do. But I will say it's had uh, some impacts on things that I've chosen uh, to do or not do. Uh, but more importantly, it's really made me realize uh, the tsunami that is facing us. And let me just say, it is the tsunami of aging Minnesotans or aging Americans. And um, I'll just have to put in a personal uh, plug here for the Alzheimer's Research and Support Act uh, that I'm that I authored and am carrying in the Senate and Rep. Deb Keel in the House. And I want you to know, well, we know, you, you hear all about how Alzheimer's is the disease of our generation. It's the most expensive disease. Uh, it is the disease that um, is the most under-recognized public health crisis we have. What you might not know is it's a women's disease. Uh, because 60% of the caregivers, and it is extensive, uh, are women. 
So this is something that affects us. Uh, caregiving is part of our lives, uh, and, uh, and it continues. But I will say this Alzheimer's tsunami is a women's issue. And um, it's, I, oh, I would think if I asked today, I'd see a lot of hands of people who are experiencing this right now. How many of you are caregiving in some form, uh, perhaps the Alzheimer's? Yes. Um, so it, it is significant. And so now my job as a legislator, in that intersection is how do we make sure that our state policies are allowing caregivers the flexibility to be caregivers and to also be employees? And then how are our policies supporting those caregivers? Um, and I think that we've done a lot. We did a lot last year. Uh, my role on the WISA legislation uh, was to make sure that we could implement those things in a way that uh, they could be implemented in our business community without causing unintended consequences for the very uh, folks they were trying to help. And I think we crafted that uh, very... Um, it's a needle that you have to thread, and I think we, we got that right. I think there's still more to do. Um, and going on as far as caregivers and the support for caregivers, we certainly want more flexibility in our workforce. Um, I was a um, co-sponsor of the Family Caregivers Act, which actually allows family members uh, the flexibility to step out of the workforce and actually provide caregiving. Uh, and so uh, th these are the, that's kind of the intersection of the things we do in the legislature. And as legislators, much of what we do is born out of personal experience. Uh, and, uh, and that's why, and let me just say, that's why we need more women in the legislature. Uh, Minnesota is, in some cases, leading the nation. We're about fourth as far as the percent of women in our, legislati in our legislature, but we still are not at what would be called parity. I think we're making great strides, thanks to, to folks like you and the people on this panel, but there is still more work to do. Um, so I'll look forward to your questions. I certainly just kind of gave you a rough uh, background here. Uh, if I have to leave, it's because session is at 11. So I'll stay as long as I can and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. My name's Pam Sartell, and I'm the owner of the Sartell Group. Uh, this is my 10th year. Yay! <laughs> and I'm still going. Um, I am the sole owner, 100%, and uh, I have been, uh, it's a technology business. We develop custom applications. In fact, we build things for you that you can't buy off the shelf. We try to build the solution that meets your needs instead of you having to fit that a square peg in the wrong hole. So that's really our, our niche of what we do. Um, my company is um, quite flexible. Um, fun is our middle name, um, first name and last. Um, and I believe in an organization that needs to be able to address the employee need. Um, and that is my number one goal uh, in, in operating the company. In fact, uh, they are my biggest asset, so why do I not focus the most on my largest asset? Um, how this all turned out is um, the first year that I started the company, uh, I was probably operating the company in about four months, and I get a call from the Duluth Hospital uh, letting me know that my father had fallen and broken his neck, and I had to get there immediately. Um, I have five other siblings, and um, I was the only one here in Minnesota, so I became the primary person at contact. Um, it was quite an uh, up and down road through the whole thing, and I can tell you that I was driving back to the city to go to the office, and I'd get calls from the ICU saying he had taken a turn from the worst, and I'd be turning around on 35W, heading back up. And it was just a crazy time, and I kept trying to figure out how am I going to build a company, run a company that I don't even know what I'm doing, quite honestly, and take care of my father all at the same time. The biggest stress that I was having is, how do I deal with this so that my employees don't know this is affecting me? And that was kind of my light bulb moment. They are going to know. And it's the same thing with my employees. 
no matter what everybody says, don't bring your personal stuff to, be, to your work, it, that is never going to happen. Everybody has to deal with their personal situations one way or another, and it's going to flow into your business. So how you as a business owner handle that is where you're going to see the benefit. When I decided to tell my employees, this is what's going on, this is what I need from you as a support, and in turn, you guys will receive the same support from me if something happens to you. And so I changed how I operated with my business, and I tried to find out how I could take away stresses from my employees so that they could actually um, feel good about coming to work and not have to worry about those small details. The first thing that I did, and trust me, every year I have to go through this, I decided I am paying 100% of my employees' medical, dental, physical, uh, benefits. And it's just not my employees. I pay also for their dependents. I pay everything. So they do not pay anything ever in out of pocket. That is something that I have done for 10 years. My bank doesn't want me to. My insurance company keeps saying, maybe you should look at a cheaper method. And I said, no, that is not going to change. You come up with something more creative that will save my company money but do not take away anything that my employees get to date. So you got to find someone you can work with. The other part that I have is the belief that you have to give your people the ability to take the time off when they need it. So you have to be flexible. So find the ways that you can make their job flexible, that they can do it by telecommuting, that they can do it part time, that they can do Odd hours, it doesn't matter. Figure it out, you can work it out. We're all a creative society. There is no excuse that we can't sit down and figure this out. I have had an employee who his mother got, uh, had ALS and he wanted to be able to be there, especially towards the end. He worked from home, why not? We have, we have the technology, we can do it. And, and everybody's jobs, so many of them are becoming that. And you can do it, and you can be supportive. Today I'm looking at a new pattern. Um, we still have the counting of the PTO, and you know, everybody guarding that. And I have been doing some heavy duty research on this. There's companies out there who have thrown away the PTO. What they said is, People can do their jobs. People know what their responsibilities are. And if you give them that responsibility, they'll take it and they'll run with it. And if they know that, you know what, I just put in 60 hours because I had a deadline and I need to take a few days off, I'm going to do that. And guess what? We're not going to go check, check, check. There's three days. We're going to do an open PTO where there is no accountability on the time that you have allotted in an annual basis. We still have a few things we have to work out in that, um, but I think that that is the next wave that we want to do and promote within the company. And I do buy groceries every week. <laughs> we, have a, we have a full kitchen. You can go out to my website, sartellgroup.com, and you'll see my office space. And we have a full kitchen. I buy food so that when my employees come in in the morning, they can fix breakfast. They don't have to worry about that. When they want to have lunch, they can eat. their snacks. They're healthy. There is chocolate, but there is healthy <laughs> <laughs> and we do have a back fridge for that happy hour that we want to celebrate once in a while. So, <laughs> so that's my story. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. And before you pass the back fridge, hey, let me just ask, do you have any openings right now? <laughs> I like chocolate. Can you hear me? All right. When I was asked to be on this panel, it was to tell my story. As an Asian American woman caring for an aging parent in St. Cloud, Minnesota. So as I tell my story, I, I want to touch on a couple of issues that I believe are relevant to, to this summit. And um, also I am part of an organization, NAPAF, National Asian um, Pacific American Women's Forum. Um, and there are several policy issues that we are looking at now. So I want to share that with you. My mother turned 100 last month. So she is possibly the oldest Asian American woman in the state and possibly in the country. And she voted. 
Yes. Now, when I say Asian American, and Bo had explained a little bit about that to you, she does not identify as Asian American. She is Singaporean, that is where we come from, as a nationality, and her ethnicity is Eurasian. We are a mixed race Asian, which is a minority group within Singapore. Asian American is a US census term. It's a socio-political term, uh, where it lumps everybody together who has you know, heritage from an Asian country. But remember, we are immigrants, we are refugees, we are permanent residents, we are citizens, or we've been here for generations. So keep that in mind. Um, my husband and I sponsored my mother's immigration to the US 20 years ago. Now, this was expected of me, and, and you've, you've spoken about it a little bit in the summit, but you have to add this cultural value within many Asian cultures of filial piety. That's a sense of duty to respect, obey, and care for parents and elder family members. And for many of us within these communities, that is the only option given to them. If you go outside of it, you are stigmatized, you are, you know, or you're not looking after your parent as you should, so it carries that, um, that burden. Um, all right, uh, so when she came to live with us, she became then the grandmother to my three children, so she became a caregiver, which allowed me then to continue a full-time job. After five years, she became a citizen. Um, and I didn't realize at that time how important that step was for, for health care access. A few months after her citizenship, I noticed that, that she was sort of carrying her, her shoulder, you know, in a funny way and sort of looking a little pained. She does not complain. She never tells me if anything is wrong with her, uh, whether or not this is just her or a cultural and traditional I think devaluation of many Asian women, and we can expand that to other places, in a very patriarchal system, makes her feel that her needs and her care within the family are not important. And it frustrates me, it, uh, it continues to frustrate me, but that is the culture she's coming from, and at 80 years, at 90 years, at 100 years, it's still there. And you have to figure out what's wrong with her to be able to help her. She's not going to tell me. Anyway, um, her, 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 her arm had been scratched uh, and bit by her pet cat. She had been teasing the cat. So it bit her. And it was starting to get infected. That's dangerous. Um, she had been trying herbal remedies, uh, ointments that she had brought from Singapore. And I do respect traditional healing. But there's a point where it doesn't work. So I dragged her off to the ER, and she was in hospital for about four days. Um, then I received a bill for about $6,000. And I'm going like, what? <laughs> Help, what? You know, I, I'm not low income, I'm mid income. Uh, I have a full-time job, my husband has a full-time job. But I was realizing this was the beginning of something that could easily get out of control. What am I going to do? It would have been easier for me to take both of us back to Singapore and have her taken care of there because of subsidized medical care in Singapore. Singapore, you know, has, people are the assets. Uh, therefore, you value people. Therefore, you subsidize health care for people. Right. Um, and and uh, where was I? I was getting extremely, extremely anxious. What am I going to do? She had already become a US citizen. Uh, I couldn't bring her back. Um, so you, you also have to remember when I said that was an important point. If she had been here less than five years, then you would, she would not have access to affordable health care. And I think Amelia had, um, had touched on that. If you are here for less than five years, you can't receive the Medicaid benefits. Uh, luckily, there were excellent social workers, excellent med medical professionals who said, well, um, you know, make her an independent 
uh, household head. Spend down, so I think that's the impoverishment act. And, um, and then, she, then she can be, um, then she can have Medicare and Medicaid. Now, I understood this and we did that, but you also have to think about, you know, the trauma that goes with that. She is no longer now a family member. Um, and, and that caused me a, a extraordinary stress. At that time, I was also diagnosed for breast cancer, and I was just thinking just now, you know, did that have a correlation? We don't know. I was able to get personal care assistance. Now, keep in mind that if I had not had um, Medicare or Medicaid, it would be extremely difficult. Um, I believe the cost is about 60000 uh, for home health care for a year. And, for, in, and in general, Asians, the income for Asians is very low at 24000 compared to 31000 for overall populations. So um, personal health care would be very difficult. Now, as you probably noticed, language is not a barrier for me. <clears throat> English, for me and my mother, is my first and only language. Um, although when I've, um, sometimes in, in certain cases, people will just look at us and say, uh, can you speak English? And then when we start speaking English, they say, oh, you speak English so well. So I, right, okay. that, that, that's basic, basic stereotyping, basic racism, but anyway. But, but it is a barrier for many of us in the Asian American community. Uh, according to the status, uh, to 2013 census data, you've got about 35% Asian Minnesotans speak English less than very well. So it becomes very difficult. If, if language was a barrier to me, it would be very hard to understand what all is going on, plus the emotional piece that, you know, now she's in the, the, uh, the nursing home, um, it's, it's, she's no longer at my table, but still, I'm able to visit her. That's, that's what is happening. A little story, you know, she had to have 24-7 uh, care about three years ago. Um, she had the help button uh, where you press for help, but she never pressed it because she was afraid that she would disturb the people at the end of that button. So, you know, it's like, oh, okay, you, 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 I, I, yeah, so that is a lot of frustration there. Um, Sun Cloud also is, it, it's about 70 miles from here. It took me about an hour and a half to come in, sometimes three hours if there are uh, challenges on the road. Um, but there are no Asian-specific services there. Uh, there are um, Somali services there but no Asian. And so there's a feeling of isolation um, in, in these outlying uh, places, even with St. Cloud. And um, so that is another challenge there. So I just want to add in terms of NAPAF and the policies that we are looking at. So you're looking at language accessible, culturally competent, paid care. Now, when you're looking at culturally competency, it's not just language. Um, and if you take even folks from that community, they have to be educated and trained to understand that the older people come from different cultural norms. And some of those norms, it, it um, you know, I, I, I get very frustrated with them. How do you overcome that to understand them? Language accessible caregiver supports, that's the CARE Act. Minnesota has the minimum of 950 for a wage rate. We need to increase that, it's good. But um, uh, in a State of the Union address, President Obama proposed a federal minimum wage of 1010. Let's work to that. And I'm not quite sure this predictable scheduling that happens. I think it's really very difficult for caregivers. And uh, what about a state-level caregiver tax credit? <laughs> Thank you for those ideas. Thank you. Yes. Senator Nelson has to be back at the Capitol at about 11 o'clock, so in about 10 minutes. So I'm going to ask if anyone has a particular question for Senator Nelson. Betty Fowler, you're on. Thank you. 
Uh, Big voice. Senator Nelson, we were in yeah. your office a um, yeah. couple of weeks ago, and we talked about all of these issues, whether it's caregiving or transportation or whatever it is. Thank you. Hi, I'm Betty Folliard. Uh, it all comes under the umbrella of the Equal Rights Amendment. And we're asking you to become a co-author with us. We've got folks from all over the state, including in the district, who are supporting an Equal Rights Amendment. And we would like to have you stand with us and be a co-author. We do have Senator Julie Rosen who has signed on. And we'd love to have you. Would you join us, please? I think it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think it's, uh, I was surprised uh, that uh, the ERA actually uh, hadn't passed. Of course, as I, as I came of age, that was a big, uh, that was a big issue. Yeah. And it still is a big issue. So uh, I'm a little uh, leery of amendments in general, but I understand uh, the necessity here. And so I will tell you, I'll give a great consideration and definitely support the policies. And uh, look, I, I don't know if there's room on the bill or not. I'll have to look and see. But um, there's a second one. Oh, there's a, I, that's what I thought it was kind of yeah. filled up. So, um, but definitely, um, I would think if I have an opportunity to vote for that, I'll definitely be voting for that. Uh, it's absolutely uh, essential. Um, and uh, we're just kind of high past the time. But I do think amendments are problematic. And so I do want to just kind of throw that out there. Um, but, um, the impetus is exactly right on target. So, um, and, and uh, let me just uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity uh, today. Really, the dialogue has been so wonderful. And uh, let me just uh, say, in, in uh, speci specifically as Pam said, you know, if your employees are worried about caregiving um, and you think they're there working for you, believe me, they're not. Their bodies may be there, but their hearts and minds and their energy are uh, with their loved ones who need them. And so I just really tip my hat uh, to Pam. And uh, it's kind of like um, getting rid of seat time, right? That's what we're asking employers to do, what Pam is doing. And let me just say, um, I serve on taxes. So I look at that tax credit, always important. I also serve on education, um, health, uh, capital investment, and jobs, ag, and rural development. So all these issues kind of come to those committees. So know that um, I will be working uh, for you and also uh, for all, all Minnesotans, but particularly our young girls uh, who are coming up through these uh, ranks. And we want to make sure that they have all the opportunities that maybe some of us did not have and that they don't face the barriers that some of us did have. So thank you for what you do. And I'll look forward to uh, seeing you soon, hopefully uh, before next year. I imagine I'll see some of you at the Capitol. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Senator Nelson, for participating this morning. You guys know I'm sort of a Minnesota history bug myself, and I'll just note that it was 42 years ago, this coming month, that the Minnesota legislature ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. Senator, before you The Minnesota you legislature leave. did, the yeah. unit, but it, it fell three states short of being included in the United States Constitution, and thank you way. to those in, you in Minnesota, Betty Polly, are taking the lead there to find a way to revive that uh, amendment. Yes. Hi. Hi. Let's have a question. My name is Sherry okay. Pugh. And I have a question for you, as you all talked about the issues for caregivers. I have a cousin who, after caregiving for her mother, passed away two years later from complications of her diabetes. But what we know, and I, and I also sit on the Minnesota Board on Aging and Act on Alzheimer's, and one of the things for caregivers is that often they neglect their own health issues while caregiving. So I guess my question is, what can be done um, to help uh, caregivers be more mindful of their health. You know, when you go to the doctor there, I say, are you safe in your home and all these questions. Could there be some sort of mandate that says, if you're a caregiver, are you taking care of your health? Or is there a notice that could be sent out? Carla says she's got one line to add to that before she leaves. Here we go. I do. Actually, that's part of the Alzheimer's Research and Support Act. Uh, $750,000 appropriated to better connect caregivers with resources, also to encourage early cognitive testing. But you are exactly right. Uh, caregivers often caregive to their own uh, detriment. And uh, we need the social constructs to support that. Part of that's uh, knowledge. Uh, and, um, and hopefully, the Alzheimer's Research and Support Act can help with that as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Pam Sartell, you said that you uh, had encountered some distress among some of your employees as they attempted to be caregivers. What thoughts do you have about 
how employers can help caregivers take care of themselves. Um, um, well, what, what I do, once again, is the encouragement of uh, the healthy lifestyle in our office. Um, we uh, have people getting up off their duffs and going walking. Um, we, we're just very mindful of ensuring that they go to the doctor. They hear me harping all the time. Um, have, have you got your checkup in? You guys don't have to pay for this. Um, get in there and do, your, do the right thing. Um, and you just, as an employer, or me uh, particularly, is I am always very conscious of when I see the stress level. And if I see that that seems to be a little bit more than normal because of what's going on, um, I tell them, you know, maybe you need a day off or uh, just walk away. Get up and walk. Do something. Uh, you have to relieve that because um, it, it just doesn't go away. So uh, it, just being conscious is really important as an employer. Uh, Hedy, anything to add about how the, the ability for caregivers to care for themselves? Um, that has to be a very conscious um, uh, decision. For me, I, I have a dog. And, and by, yes, by about four or five hours at the computer, it tells me to go. One of the things that I, I wanted to add, though, is that by needing to care for my mother, um, I had to change from a full-time job to a part-time job. It was not possible for me to be away from home uh, more than a few hours a day. I, 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 even with personal care assistance, I needed to be there. And, and to say a little more about that, would a change in work, workplace policies enabled you to have continued in your role, or was it just simply not an option? Not an option, not for the work I was doing. But basically, I developed a home office, and that made total sense for me. Okay, very good. Who else has a quite a bunch of questions here? Let's go back over here. Hi, Sherilyn LaChapelle, president of Minnesota Black Nurses Association. And my uh, father-in-law died of Alzheimer's. My mother-in-law currently has it. My mother's got dementia, early Alzheimer's. And my sister's taking care of her in Chicago, and the rest of the family's helping. My sister-in-law, who's an attorney, had to leave her practice to take care of my mother-in-law. I say all this because as a 41-year nurse, respite care, and I'm sorry that the uh, legis state legislator left, but uh, respite care would go a long way to helping families. I mean, right now, some insurance companies provide five days. That's nothing. Uh, minimum one day a week where those, the family could be alone, go somewhere, go to a hotel, get out. It goes a long way to lowering the blood pressure, sanity, things like that. Also, they should pr be provided with uh, things like a massage, part of the insurance contract, yoga, <laughs> meditation, because all of these things will help lower insurance costs so that they don't have a stroke or a heart attack. But respite goes a long way. If anybody's ever been under pressure 24-7, let me know how you managed. Yeah. Yeah. Good comment. We'll take that as a good, helpful comment rather than a question and pass the microphone again here. Who's got next? Stand up if you've got the microphone. Here it is. Here she is. Linda, hi. Hi. Linda Hopkins, uh, founder of Team Women Minnesota, a nonprofit for the development of women and um, business skills. I wanted to take a moment to mention that I also work as an attorney in dis Social Security Disability Law. And um, if, uh, if you listen to your girlfriends and you listen to your family and you note that uh, certain illnesses um, are very difficult to get Social Security Disability coverage approval on, you will undoubtedly notice that these are usually illnesses that um, a majority of the illness people, ill people are women. And I can give you one example, and that is fibromyalgia. I and other people in the world of businesses notice that women, this is a women's issue, this is a women's disability. Uh, those symptoms are very difficult to spot. 
Uh, I can also tell you that Mayo Clinic has a website describing how to diagnose this illness and that um, I went to Senator Franken's office and asked for changes in regulations to have this recognized as a specific illness. Because before that, when we went into court, the judges would often say, well, this isn't a real illness. It's not listed as an illness by Social Security. There are no signs. It's one that's all in your head. How many times have you heard that, ladies? I was going to tell you that PTSD, which is a common problem with domestic abuse, as well as other issues, was not recognized by even the Minnesota courts for a long time until soldiers coming back from Vietnam and other conflict areas developed it. So <laughs> um, my advice is to listen to your girlfriends, listen to your families, keep an eye on um, if these illnesses are occurring more in women than men, and talk to a lawyer if you see that. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. We're looking for questions here, and please let me know Who's, uh, who's going to have a, uh, a question? Which panelists you'd like to respond to the question? Hi. Hi, I'm Elaine Nguyen. I'm a psychologist, and I also work with the project for uh, veterans using uh, working with PTSD. I just wanted to say, you know, this pattern starts really early because the stay-at-home parent is in a lot of ways like the one who stays home to take care of the elders. And I just want to call attention to that and wonder if, you know, talking about that in connection would be a way to push we, we say economic issues. Do we see more connection in, in legislation and in consideration uh, when we talk about child care, which is a hot topic at the legislature this year, and we talk about preschool, are we also thinking about caregiving at the senior side? Should we be doing that, do you think, uh, Hetty? We're talking about PTSD, and if you look at refugee communities, so that is absolutely uh, mental health issues are, are uh, a big issue and has to be part of that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I was intrigued earlier today when we, we heard um, uh, one of the, uh, I think it was uh, Jennifer Loon say, if we're thinking about uh, tax credits for child care, perhaps there should be tax credits for caregiving. Right. Perhaps we should link these two things. State level caregiver tax credits. Who else has got a microphone in their hand? Here comes Deb with the microphone. Back here. Whoa. Oh, I'm seeing. Okay. Kenya, let's let Kenya go first. Thank you. So, okay. Am I good now? What do I need to do? Come up, go back? Come forward? Okay. Simon says. Uh, <laughs> it's one of my favorite childhood games, right? Um, so, as you were talking, I was thinking about communities of color. And I was thinking about personal care assistance and local home health um, care agencies and how that's a caregiving industry. And there's a lot of people of color, particularly in the Liberian community, uh, but just communities of color who starting businesses um, because of our cultural practices of taking care of ourselves and our, our elders. Like we typically do not send our elder to nursing homes. We are the nursing homes. And that's a, you can find that woven throughout our cultures um, from Liberian to Asian to Somalian to, I mean, it's just a part of who we are. In that, um, what we've seen is that this, we have seen how small businesses and these healthcare workers have been disincentivized to do this work. I've worked as a personal care assistant for my mother for maybe 10 years. And I can tell you that over the last four years, my pay has been reduced because I'm a relative. And so I am encouraged to work from a moral perspective rather than being valued for my time as an employee who's caregiving for my family. And that in turn makes it difficult for the businesses that we are um, building who are not being paid and compensated enough, so they have to have zillions of uh, clients, with, with, and even the scrutiny on the, the amount of hours that we're given. And so some of this is about value and how policymakers and folks who sit in these institutions as leaders in the state offices, um, their value and perspective for people of color and what they think we should and should not be doing. And this is a problem throughout the entire country. So how 
is this conversation, our cultural perspectives and realities being carried in this conversation forward to the legislator to make sure that we are considered um, in the new thinking about caregivers um, in the workplace. I wish we hadn't lost our legislator on our panel because she could maybe reflect on that. But it is the case that you are you're absolutely correct. I believe it was the 2011 legislature that uh, cut pay to relatives who were caregivers for disabled family members. And that was a, a bad decision that was reversed by the courts, and then again, rever then reversed by the legislature and the governor in the following session. So th at some point, some message got through, and I hope the message continues. Yes. Hi, I'm Phyllis Moen from the University of Minnesota. And I want to ask Pam, how can we get other companies and businesses to follow your lead? Um, yeah, I would love to know the magic uh, answer to that. Um, I, I'm an I'm a advocate and a cheerleader about this to everybody. Um, and I have uh, actually been in the Star and Tribune uh, with regards to this and uh, my support for this. I belong to several organizations. I'm an active member of the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Um, and everybody who hears about my story is in awe because they all think you can't do it. And I keep telling them you can do it. Um, you might have to, uh, I, I, I didn't take a pay for two years to ensure that I did not take away my employees' benefits. So um, it is just a constant, you got to keep reminding them. And I, I will tell you, there are companies out there who do this. There are companies besides mine. I got several emails and phone calls from them saying thank you for being a voice and telling people that it's out there. And Pam, with a labor shortage coming, is part of the, uh, part of the story that you emphasize Yes. Worker retention, worker yes. morale. Talk about that for just a moment. That is key. Um, there is going to be a major shortage in our workforce. People don't understand how short we are going to be. And, uh, and it's going to get worse. And if an employer does not, does not take that into consideration, they're going to have people jumping ship and looking for that organization who is willing to uh, cater to them as an employee. And, and that will change things. And another thing that you're going to see, and I just uh, was at a conference where the speaker, the keynote speaker said, the Fortune 500 companies that we know today, 40% of them will be gone tomorrow uh, or within the next five years because they are not making the changes that the small businesses are, and they're growing. So you will see it. It is coming. We're down to just the last few minutes of our panel, and I see a few hands up, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I want Hi. to tell us the last <laughs> words. I have a quick question. Um, Where are you? Right, right over here. here. Hi. Hi. Hey, this, you got the last question. Be very quick, please. Okay. So I guess I'm wondering if you can speak to, um, w pertaining to the policy, we're going in great directions in terms of supporting caregivers, but I think... Oh. Me? <laughs> okay. Shout. Go, go to small business. I, I'm, I get away. I'm not kidding you. Everybody thinks that they've got to go back into the large business. And, and, and keep, keep in mind that that is going to change. The, the wave is coming, and you're going to see it. If, if you are struggling, look for small business that is doing that. And if nothing else, be creative and jump in and start your own business. It really, I mean, I'm not kidding you. There are opportunities everywhere. Hetty, we're down to just a moment or two left. Do you have a final word? Yes. Um, you got to continue the conversation, but don't let it stop okay. there. And advocate, strongly advocate for policies that really help women caregivers if you really value women and women of color. Okay, and Pam, did you have anything more to add? No, nope, okay. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Right. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh,